Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Mishnah, and I'm the president-elect of the Planetary Sciences section of the AGU. The 2020 Fred Whipple Award is being presented to Dr. Robert Pepin, Professor Emeritus of the School of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Minnesota. The Whipple Award and lecture are presented annually to recognize significant contributions to the field of planetary science and is the highest award presented by the Planetary Sciences section to mid or late career scientists. It is named in honor of its first recipient, Fred Whipple, a distinguished astronomer, professor, and AGU fellow, whose work revolutionized our understanding of cometary composition and structure, comets being an important reservoir of primordial volatiles in the solar system. The recipient of this year's Whipple Award, Robert Pepin, likewise has made a career out of revolutionary discoveries in his study of primordial volatiles throughout the solar system and in tying together the origin and history of noble gases and nitrogen isotopes from their earliest presence in the solar nebula to latter-day planetary interiors and atmospheres. Dr. Pepin earned his AB from Harvard and later like his award's namesake, a PhD from Berkeley. Almost immediately after leaving university, he became a researcher and later faculty at the University of Minnesota, where, apart from a short departure to direct the Lunar Science Institute in the post-Apollo years, he remained throughout his career. And what a career it has been. Some of his early work in the late 1960s was at the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, serving on the Lunar Sample Analysis Planning Team, the Science Working Group for Lunar Surface Operations, and as Mission Control Science Advisor for Apollos 14 through 17. As a physicist and geochemist of his stature, he was among the first to study the Apollo 11 lunar samples in his laboratory, which surely must have been a highlight of even his distinguished career. By the mid-1970s, attention had turned to Mars, both by NASA and Dr. Pepin, and he was involved in some of the earliest interpretations of Viking lander data on the composition of the Martian atmosphere. A series of papers over several decades on both the nitrogen and noble gas composition of meteorites conclusively determined the origin of some of these samples to be Mars, a finding Dr. Pepin considers to be among the most significant of his career. Subsequent mission participation has included the Genesis and Stardust missions, and presently, the Mars Science Laboratory, all with a focus on uncovering the story that is told by volatiles, noble gases, and their isotopes about the solar system's history and evolution. Robert Pepin is a fellow of the Meteoritical Society, the Geochemical Society and Association of Geochemistry, and a member of the 1993 Fellows class of the AGU. Today, we are privileged to hear a personal retrospective of Dr. Pepin's career titled Adventures in Planetary Science, 1960 to 2020, and touching on many of these professional highlights. Please do join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Pepin and warmly congratulating him on this well-deserved honor. This talk focuses on noble gas distributions and their compositions in extraterrestrial and terrestrial materials of interest to the planetary sciences. It is structured around research at Minnesota and its relevance to other areas of study in the AGU sections. Many years ago, noble gas practitioners were humorously dis described by someone in a different research area as a priesthood that conducts its mysterious research crafts in the shadows of its laboratories and reports results in arcane language. Actually, that sounded pretty cool to a young fellow in search of a research area. I joined John Reynolds Noble Gas Laboratory at Berkeley as a graduate student in 1960. A principal focus in those days at Berkeley was on xenon and meteorites, rich and stable isotopes, nine of them, 
and free of chemical interactions, an ideal isotopic recorder of physical processing such as mass fractionation. Interpretations, however, can be subtle and complex. And I remember John saying that medical classification of xenon as a light anesthetic came as no problem, no surprise to him. For years, he'd observed his audiences nodding off whenever he talked about it. On to Minnesota in 1965, the beginning of 55 years of uninterrupted noble gas research there. My first graduate students, David Black, Jeff Basford, and Doug Finney, were a remarkable group. While David was interested in all sorts of things, some completely unrelated to noble gases, he published influential papers on gas isotopic distributions and their sources in a variety of meteorites. Jeff carried the ball on our lunar sample research in the early 1970s. Doug's interest was in terrestrial noble gases, and he and I later teamed up on an attempt to model Earth's atmospheric xenon evolution. Let's begin with neon. In 1967, I had written about neon and bulk meteorite samples, where all the gases are driven out in a single high temperature heating step and then analyzed. Neon isotope ratios got to get this laser pointer working. Neon isotope ratios fell in the triangular array evident in the left diagram, bounded by solar right there, spallation, neon and spallation is created by high energy cosmic rays during the space exposure of the meteorite, and then a more enigmatic component at the other corner, uh, neon A, which itself is probably a combination of two or three additional components which are not rigorously identified. At any rate, it's pretty clear that uh, these bulk meteorite isotopic analyses all fell within the boundaries of a spallation to solar to neon A triangle. Notice that neon Q uh, right here and its isotopic composition plots there, which is ubiquitous in carbonaceous matter in meteorites, but it isn't an obvious component in bulk neon and re uh, releases here. None of the isotopic trends appear to converge on it. However, Q does play a major role in samples of cometary material and interplanetary dust particles, IDPs, discussed later in the talk. The question is, is there more to neon than meets the eye in the left diagram? Dave argued that a different and higher resolution analytic technique might show a fine structure not apparent in bulk releases. It seemed worth a try, and evidence for another component was in fact found. Black assembled a group of several primitive carbonaceous chondrites and heated them in small temperature steps. This approach re revealed a dramatic plunge in the 20 to 22 ratio for neon released around 1000 degrees shown in the right hand diagram. This turned out to be the discovery experiment for neon E, the first clear and straightforward detection of what today is membership in a whole suite 
of particles synthesized in other stellar systems, transported into the early solar system, and incorporated into meteorites, the so-called pre-solar grains. Ten years after this Neon E discovery, Peter Eberhardt and his colleagues at the University of Bern succeeded in isolating its mineral hosts and in estimating the neon, neon E composition, which turned out to be more than 99% 22 neon. So its 20 to 22 ratio is essentially down here at zero. Neon E is hosted in pre-solar silicon carbide and graphite. The silicon carbide and graphite, together with other pre-solar grain mineralogies, carrying an array of additional exotic isotopic compositions, signal formation in outflows from a variety of extracellular sources. Red giant AGB stars, other carbon-rich stars, supernovae, perhaps novae. In the mid-1970s, Doug Finney and I were beginning to grapple with the issue of Earth's atmospheric xenon composition. The problem here is that it isotopically resembles no other known xenon reservoir in the solar system. Previous work at Berkeley had already established the probability that the light xenon isotopes in air were products of mass fractionation during escape to space of a xenon inventory called primordial xenon initially acquired by Earth. What would the isotopic characteristics of this primordial xenon have been? Two constraints were set on its composition. We used isotope ratio data from six meteorites to construct a seven-dimensional hyperplane of meteoritic isotopic correlations and required the primordial terrestrial xenon composition to fall on this hyperplane, a stipulation that its presence would not have been restricted just to Earth, but would also appear in meteorites. Terrestrial air xenon is not compatible with the meteoritic hyperplane, testifying to its unique isotopic character. Second, the mass fractionation hypothesis is formalized in that it must yield air ratios relative to xenon 130 at masses 124 and 126 and 128. Our selected composition for primordial xenon, called U-xenon, is shown in panel A. Its only realistic alternative is solar wind xenon. Both satisfy the fractionation constraint as seen in panel B. But solar xenon is eliminated by the observation that its fractionation generates an excess of xenon-136 clearly evident in B that is well above its relative atmospheric abundance. However, diagram B also indicates that using on fractionation does not replicate the current atmosphere at masses 129 and 131 through 136, but instead lies below them. The reasons for these discrepancies illustrated in the lower panel are straightforward. Terrestrial air contains outgas products from decay of the now extinct radionuclides iodine-129 and plutonium-244 that were incorporated into the bulk silicate earth at its formation. These radionuclides were absent in primordial uxenon. From among the many possibilities for using on composition, the one shown here allows the uxenon deficits at masses 131 through 136 to be elevated to exactly the observed atmospheric ratios by addition of outgas xenon 
from Fission of Plutonium-244. The story is similar for Xenon-129, elevated in air by outgassed radiogenic Xenon-129. Therefore, in this view, Earth's atmospheric xenon is a hybrid generated by uxenon fractionation and, at certain isotopes, augmented by radiogenic decay products degassed from the mantle. Curiosity looks rather shopworn after crawling through windy deserts and dunes over clays and around rocks for the past eight Earth years. All systems are still more or less functionally, as far as I know. My living room furniture is beginning to look a little like this. I haven't dusted for weeks. Photograph of EETA 79001 at its collection site at Elephant Moraine in Antarctica. This meteorite covered with a scabrous fusion crust formed by drag heating as it entered the atmosphere was established by Bogart and Johnson's noble gas analyses as the prototype of the meteorites from Mars clan. But before discussing their work, a note about its rather boring name. Meteorites are usually named after a nearby post office, village, town, or geologic formation. But try to find a post office or settlement in Antarctica. So instead, each Antarctic meteorite is given a coded alphanumeric ID, efficient but not very evocative compared, for example, to the South American Vaca Muerta meteorite which translates as dead cow. One gets the feeling that there's a tragedy somewhere in its story. The dark pods visible in this cut face of 7901 are glassy inclusions, presumably created by severe shock. Bogart and Johnson at NASA Houston sampled and analyzed several of them for noble gases. In a landmark 1983 paper, they reported that gases trapped in the glasses strikingly resembled in elemental and some isotope ratios those measured in the Martian atmosphere by Viking. They proposed, with a question mark in their title, that Mars was the parent body of 79001. This was the first in what is now a large number of meteorites, more than 100, that have been identified on various grounds as originating on Mars. As an aside, there's an interesting question here. Why so many Martian meteorites? In 1984, George Wetherill calculated the likely fates of small ejecta exiting Mars above escape velocity and found a surprisingly efficient orbital pipeline between Mars and Earth such that about 2% or so of all the materials ejected from Mars in a particular crating event would impact Earth within 10 million years. That's about 40% of all such Martian ejecta that would ever encounter Earth. So the Martian meteorites tend to arrive relatively quickly after ejection. Many of their exposure ages in space during transit are in fact close to 10 million years or less. Mars research at Minnesota in the mid 1980s was largely driven by Roger Reins a, com a graduate student in our research team. He was deeply interested in Martian research as it progressed, especially in mechanisms for trapping ambient atmospheric gases into shock-generated glasses, 
their efficiency, and the question of where in the glasses the gases are sighted. He quickly became a mainstay of our Mars research activities. Over his time with us, he designed and carried out a series of experiments to illuminate these topics and wrote or co-authored co several reports on what they revealed. It's clear that the passing years haven't dimmed his enthusiasm for Mars. Rogers currently the PI of the ChemCan LIBS, L-I-B-S instrument on the Curiosity rover that's contributed immensely to the chemical database for rocks and soils in Gale Crater. These two papers played pivotal roles in the Martian meteorite story. The impact of Bogart and Johnson's 1983 detection of Mars-like noble gases in EETA 79001 has already been mentioned. Two years earlier, Urs Frick, then a postdoctoral fellow at Minnesota, had developed an instrumental protocol that allowed very small amounts of nitrogen to be analyzed in a statically operated, uh, unpumped mass spectrometer as it is for noble gas measurements. This technical breakthrough reduced by more than four orders of magnitude the previous lower limit for accurate measurement of nitrogen abundance and its 15-14 ratio by dynamic, that is pumped, mass spectrometry. This new technique was first applied to nitrogen trapped in 79001 glasses in 1983. Of course, any two data points to find a line. But this one, based on two Minnesota analyses of nitrogen in 79001 glass samples provided by Don Bogard, attracted attention because it passes precisely through the Viking data point for Mars atmosphere. Nitrogen is exceptionally diagnostic for Mars because of the very high 15 to 14 isotope ratio in its atmosphere. This intersection with Viking's composition strongly supports Bogart and Johnson's Martian origin hypothesis for 79001 to the extent that the question mark in the title of their original noble gas report appears to no longer apply. 79001 is, in fact, from Mars. A third nitrogen data point was added in 1986. In panel A, all three are seen to, seen to be collinear along essentially the same line through Viking, interpreted as a mixing line between Martian atmosphere and a second nitrogen component located at its lower left end. A prime candidate for this one is the Martian meteorite Chassigny, a cumulate dunite widely thought to represent the ultramafic Martian mantle and its noble gas and nitrogen inventories. Chassigny's composition is plotted as the yellow triangle falling close to the mixing line in the panel A insert. An important observation in view of the following discussion of xenon in Mars atmosphere is that Chassigny's xenon composition is solar, not atmospheric. Panel B shows a plot of the nitrogen 15-14 ratio versus 36 argon over nitrogen rather than 40 argon over nitrogen as in A. The mixing line defined here still intersects Viking with an error, but on the other side of its nominal value. As the artillery would say, the target is bracketed. 
This shows a summary of the nitrogen story as of 2013. By this time, other laboratories had developed capabilities for micro-nitrogen analysis, so it no longer rested entirely on the Minnesota measurements. But as seen here, addition of data from different laboratories on meteorites other than 79001 does not materially alter the picture. The direct measurement of Martian uh, atmosphere by the Mars Science Laboratory, MSL, on the Curiosity lies within the Viking error envelope, but as shown, barely intersects the total gas mixing line uncertainty. In 2013, this measurement fell well to the right of its present position, but shifted left on a later recalibration of the spectrometer's nitrogen sensitivity. Whether its present position is accurate will depend on results of future recalibrations. Isotopic data for xenon trapped in the EETA 79001 and Zagami shock glasses, except for xenon 129, lie precisely along a curve generated by hydrodynamic escape of an initially solar composition atmosphere. This is in marked contrast to the unaltered solar xenon and Chassigny, assumed to represent Mars mantle xenon. Three intrinsic conclusions can be drawn from these data. First, Mars initially contained both interior and primordial atmospheric xenon of solar composition, in marked contrast to Earth's primordial atmospheric U-xenon. Second, substantially elevated xenon-129 is present in Mars' atmosphere, as on Earth, but there is no sign of the heavy isotopes of perturbations due to outgas plutonium fission products. Both the planet's initial endowment of plutonium and the nature and time scales of its degassing mechanisms are central issues here. Third, Chassigny's solar xenon composition indicates there has been no significant exchange of interior and atmospheric xenon since the advent of atmospheric loss. Now the Curiosity rover rolls into the scene, charged with the high priority objective of directly measuring Mars' atmospheric compositions. The most precise of its three xenon measurements are shown by the yellow squares. They trend along the fractionation curve defined by the shock glass data with no or only relatively small offsets except at masses 124 and 126. The marked elevations of these isotopes could signal the presence of a spallation component in the atmosphere generated in and outgassed from the regolith during several billion years of cosmic ray bombardment. We explored this possibility using estimates of spallation production rates in the regolith by subtracting increasing amounts of this hypothetical spallation component from all isotopes until the corrected composition shown by the red squares straddled the fractionation curve at 124 and 126. Corrections were also applied for non-spallogenic contributions to other isotopes, most importantly at xenon 130 by subtraction of a xenon 129 hydride interference. This is generated when a small fraction of the xenon 129 picks up a hydrogen atom and the combination registers at mass 130. Results of this exercise were remarkable. The red squares denoting Curiosity's corrected xenon composition now lie accurately along the fractionation curve for all isotopes. However, as promising as it seems, there's a problem with the spallation scenario that appears to be fatal. If a spallation component actually exists in Mars' atmosphere, 
why wasn't its isotopic signature recorded in xenon trapped in the meteoritic glasses? They do contain detectable spallation xenon, but this is attributable not to Mars atmosphere, but instead to in-space cosmic ray irradiation during transits from Mars to Earth. The structure that looks like a tennis racket protruding above the spacecraft contains 130 aerogel cells for capturing dust particles as stardust traverses the coma at about 6 kilometers per second relative to the comet. It was fold and folded and stowed in the capsule below it for Earth return. One of these two blocks cut from the edge of aerogel cell 2044 contains a beautiful track, designated as track 41. Panel A shows a full view of track 41. The incident coma particle forming it disintegrated on deceleration in the aerogel, creating a bulbous cavity lined with projectile debris. The Keystone sampling tool was used to excise material from the cavity wall. A typical Keystone sample containing a snippet of track wall debris is shown in panel B. A collaboration between Minnesota and Bernard Marty's analytic team at CRPG in France was implemented to carry out the first measurements of helium and neon in a little to coma particle. The average mass of particulate matter recovered from the track 41 wall in the six analyzed samples was estimated to be a few hundred picograms. Panel A shows a measurable neon was present in two of them. <clears throat> One analyzed at Minnesota, the ST identification, and the other at CRPG, Thera identification. Helium isotope ratios shown in panel B were obtained from two Minnesota samples. At the time, analytic procedures at CRPG did not allow helium measurements, but two additional samples from track 41 were later analyzed there for helium with results indistinguishable from the Minnesota data in panel B. This was the first detection of Q-like neon in a non-meteoritic sample without measurable carbonaceous matter. Helium ratios are elevated above helium Q, possibly by a solar wind component that would not have affected the neon. As seen in the bottom panel, neon concentrations in track 41 are very large, exceeding the levels seen in solar wind irradiated IDPs and lunar regolith ilmenites. We suspect that similar implantation of energetic ions is responsible for the high neon loading of the coma particle, but in an environment characterized by Q neon, rather than solar wind irradiation. Given the track 41 results, Russ Palma embarked on a systematic survey of gases in cell 2044, again in collaborations with CRPG at Nazi and with Andrew Westfall at Berkeley for sample preparation and microscopic scanning. Sample locations are shown here. Walls of small aerogel blocks were cut in the neighborhood of track 41 together with both vertical and horizontal slices. Block and slice samples were individually extracted and analyzed over the six year duration of the project. An immediate finding was that samples containing noble gases were essentially randomly located 
within the block and slice arrays, with adjacent samples either blank or with lower levels of different noble gas compositions. Some were deeply sighted below the cell surface, others shallow, with no positional patterns. Substantial fraction, fra fractions of detected ne neon displayed Q-neon isotopic signatures, so appearance of this composition in tract 41 is not unique in cell 2044. An example of these peculiar noble gas distributions is sample 20A, the lower half of vertical slice 20 shown in the diagram. It contained no detectable carrier grains or tracks, but still released very large amounts of helium and neon together with high levels of water, carbon dioxide, and hydrocarbons. The neon displayed an unusual 20 neon to 22 neon ratio of greater than 18, far above that of either Q neon or solar wind neon. And yet the upper half of slice 20 and the adjacent slices 18 and 19 recorded no such compositions. They were either essentially blank or carried traces of isotopically different helium and neon. Andrew Westfall spotted these two small tracks and their projectile debris in the surface of cell 2086 and excised them in toto for analysis. Complete tracks offer an opportunity to measure gases in all the projectile fragments and not just those in small snippets of the cavity walls of larger tracks that may well contain materials unrepresentative of the entire track. Unfortunately, these two were too small to yield accurate noble gas measurements. However, enough data were obtained to suggest that track 181 materials reflect a solar wind-like inventory. The more abundant neon in track 182 displays a sub-Q composition similar to that found in several cell 2044 samples. High-resolution zoom movies were used by Mike Zielinski and his team at NASA Houston to scan 17% of the surface and shallow subsurface of cell 2028. This is one frame of a surface focus scan. Note the surface dust contamination from the laboratory. What is seen inside the red circle? A clue. The correct answer is nothing. Now, over the same area, the scan focus was shifted to an approximately 50 micron depth. Now what appears in the, in the same red circle? A clue, an approximately one micron particle, clearly visible in the four times blow up for those who aren't convinced that there's anything in the small circle. Note the now defocused surface dust. It's possible to see the tracks carved out by the particles lodged in the subsurcus of this cell. They are not normal to the surface. Instead, their radiance point to an edge of the very appropriately named Whipple Shield on the Stardust spacecraft. Apparently a coma grain struck and shattered there and sprayed parts of cell 2086 with low energy fragments that penetrated to shallow depths. Zelinsky and his team provided us with two 200 micron thick surface slices of 2086 for analysis from areas populated to varying degrees by these subsurface fragments. That was a very labor intensive task for the team for which many thanks are due. Sure enough, one of these slices presumably rich in subsurface fragments, 
released abundant helium and neon. The helium 3-4 ratio suggests a touch of solar wind that would not have perturbed the neon composition. That fell precisely in the Q-neon range for 20 neon over 22 neon and close to it for the 21 to 22 ratio. It was becoming quite clear that Q-neon is widely distributed in VILD2 coma samples. Calculated neon concentrations are generally higher than those displayed by lunar ilmenites and normal IDPs. Both of these latter samples carry neon implanted by solar wind irradiation. In contrast, all of the others, except for the small tracks 181 and 182, display Q-neon isotopic signatures. As shown by the ilmenites and normal IDPs, ion implantation can generate large noble gas loadings. The pervasive Q signatures and high concentrations shown here suggest neon implantation by U comp Q composition uh, ion radiation, not solar wind. Five of the Stardust samples, six counting track 41, display robust signatures of the neon 20 to 22 ratio in Q. These are shown in the Q range box, plotted at their average value where the error bar in the top sample represents the small standard error of their mean. Interestingly, the neon ratio falls below Q in twice that number of stardust measurements. Air contamination of Q-bearing samples is not responsible. Instead, the diagram appears to reflect mixing of Q with the HL neon composition found in meteoritic nanodiamonds, HL neon alone, or for the two extreme red points, mixing with neon E. The implication is that dust in the will two comma carries both of these exotic components and probably others. For example, the helium three spike noted in the next slide. The other half of the Stardust samples, the blank blocks containing no detectable extraterrestrial gases, show no evidence for air neon contamination our basis for ruling it out in the previous slide. A helium composition consisting essentially of helium-3 alone has never been seen before. The solar wind rich sample was found in aerogel adhering to the block containing track 182, which has a distinctly different composition. So again, this is an isolated occurrence with no reflection in adjacent materials. The failure to detect gas carrier grains, tracks, or both in this and many other noble gas enclaves at various depths is one of the profound puzzles encountered in this study. This IDP was named by Julian Stadolna, one of the first to study it. Mancha translates as spot or blemish. Manchanito as a little spot. Manchanito's neon and helium compositions are dead ringers for those in Stardust Track 41, even extending to the helium-3 to helium-4 ratio ele elevated above neon uh, helium Q in 41. Its neon concentration is only moderately below that in 41. One could conclude from this diagram that Manchinito is a twin of the Track 41 projectile. But Manchinito is an entirely different beast compared to the Track 41 gas carriers. Its parent cluster and Manchinito itself 
are shown in the right vertical column. Its TEM diffraction pattern identifies it as fully amorphous glass. And that's how it behaves on degassing. The profile of neon release versus temperature, the black data points in the right figure, is precisely congruent with Matsuda et al.'s release profile for terrestrial obsidian glass, shown by the solid curve. In striking contrast, neon is released from the track 41 materials in a sharp outburst near 1200 degrees. So the carriers here are definitely not amorphous glasses. It would appear that the track 41 projectile and Manchanito both acquired their neon in a Q-rich radiative environment where track 41 gases were implanted into refractory materials and Manchanitos into glass. This sequence of giant cluster particle illustrations was designed by Don Brownlee. Giant is a relative term. For those who may not view the world in microns, the 100 micron scale bar spans a little more than the width of a human hair. Not mine though. My hair is getting skinnier and skinnier. Fifteen giant cluster particle uh, grains of various types, ranging from about 5 to 15 microns in size, were prepared at Washington for noble gas analyses at Minnesota. This Washington-Minnesota collaboration was comprehensive and fruitful. Each particle was microtomed at Washington for optical and SCM examinations that yielded its mineralogy, chemical composition, and estimated mass. The 15 potted butts, together with a few of the microtome sections, were individually wrapped for the Minnesota measurements. Particle masses calculated from measured volumes and estimated densities were used to construct neon concentrations. They span a wide range, but as a group they clearly fall in the high concentration end of the diagram. Here's why it's not solar wind, as stated in the previous slide. Of the 15 measured ratios, only two relatively imprecise ones indicate the presence of low abundance traces of solar wind. The third solar datum has a very large uncertainty and could lie almost anywhere. It's likely that the large mass of the giant cluster particle shielded most of its constituent grains from shallowly penetrating solar wind radiation. 80% of these grains display Q or sub-Q compositions. The Q and sub-Q populations in stardust and the giant cluster particle display eerily similar neon 2022 ratio distributions, except for the two low ratios found in stardust. The six grains displaying Q like 20 over 22 ratios in the giant cluster particle are shown in the Q range box as they are for stardust plotted against their average with the error bar at the top indicating the deviation of their mean. Averages of these two Q-bearing populations overlap nicely. Q and sub-Q compositions are present in two-thirds of the stardust aerogel measurements shown in the upper panel and half of the giant cluster particle grains in the lower. 
This similarity, similarity arguably points to derivation of the giant cluster particle from a comet, if not from Vil2 itself, then from a compositionally similar one as far as the observed neon 20 to neon 22 ratios are concerned. But as shown next, its history in the nebula prior to cometary incorporation must have differed radically from that of the Will2 gas carriers. The neon 21 to 22 ratio was routinely measured along with 20 over 22 in the G giant cluster particle grains. A startling observation was the presence of enormous spallation generated excesses in neon 21 over its relative abundances in the Q, sub Q or solar base compositions. They reach levels approaching two orders of magnitude above spallation abundances seen in the most heavily cosmic gray irradiated meteorites. This is clearly an observation in search of a very special radiation environment. Chemical data from SEM examinations of microtome sections of the G giant particle grains were used to calculate neon 21 production rates from both galactic and solar cosmic gray irradiation in each of them. The resulting small particle exposure ages to the present flux of galactic cosmic rays range from implausibly to impossibly long. Solar cosmic rays at their present fluxes are even less capable of accounting for these levels of spallogenic neon 21 over possible irradiation times. But this is not the case for grains that might have resided, however briefly, in an environment close to the young evolving sun. Fogelson et al. observing star formation in Orion estimated an increase in solar flare activity from young solar type stars in the Orion Nebula by some five orders of magnitude relative to the present Sun. As seen in this plot, exposures at say a few tenths of an AU to such intense solar cosmic ray fluxes could generate these copious neon 21 excesses in time scales of millennia instead of giga years. The giant cluster particle would subsequently have been ejected from this early near-sun environment to comet forming distances in the nebula. An intriguing and not entirely impossible scenario. Some implications of this study. One of these in particular is relevant to the widespread occurrence of Q-type gases in stardust samples and in two of the three IDPs we've analyzed in this study. Meteoritic phase Q is cited somewhere in its poorly characterized carbonaceous matter, but there's no evidence that this kind of material is its host here. The pictured giant particle grain is stuffed with Q-neon but contains no detectable organics that could act as its carrier. Implantation by Q ion irradiation is again implicated. These particles were collected by high altitude aircraft at times when debris from the tails of comet Grig Scolorum, GS in the diagram, and Temple Tuttle, TT, could have been settling through the stratosphere. 
Two isotopically differing dust populations are clearly evident in the 15 grains allocated for study at Minnesota. The first group of six in blue with clear neon signatures of solar implantation are rather humdrum in the sense that they're the most abundant type of interplanetary dust termed normal IDPs and are commonly present on collection flags. The isotopic characteristics of the second group in red and primarily including grains from the Grig Scholarum collection is radically different. It displays wide variations in neon 20 abundances that are completely uncorrelated with neon 21. This is the first observation of this kind of neon isotope pattern in IDPs. We call these anomalous IDPs. Compositional offsets between the normal and anomalous populations is evident in this plot of the log of the helium-4 over neon-20 ratio versus the 20 to 20, 22 to 20 ratio. The normal group includes 64 analyses of, from various sources, six of them in blue from this study. Note that the log plot tends to mute the actual 100-fold span of the helium to neon ratio. The isotopic contrast between the two IDP groups is shown more dramatically in this diagram, where the 22 to 20 ratio is replaced by the more familiar 20 over 22. Here the normal IDPs are confined to a narrow band in 20 over 22 space, capped by the solar wind ratio of approximately 13.9 whereas the anomalous population spikes all the way up to 20 over 22 of 150 with a, re a relatively constant helium to neon ratio in most of them. On our suspicion that in the anomalous IDPs, we were seeing products synthesized in a stellar explosion specifically in a white dwarf outburst, Palma and I asked Bob Gerritz in astrophysics at Minnesota and Sumner Starfield at Arizona State to participate in data interpretations. Gerritz for his white dwarf observing experience and Starfield for his expertise in calculating products generated by theoretical nucleosynthetic networks in NOVA outbursts. This slide shows neon and helium ratios in the anomalous IDP group compared to Starfield's calculations, designated by a symbol that looks like a coronavirus, sorry about that, for a thermonuclear runaway on a 1.25 solar mass neon nova, and also to ratios in total ejecta from a 15 solar mass type 2 supernova from calculations by Rocher et al. The black bars represent Jose et al's calculated spreads in neon isotope ratios generated in nova explosions on white dwarfs of varying mass and alternative nucleosynthetic networks. It's clear that Starfield's thermonuclear runaway products for a neon nova both lie within Jose et al's calculational spread and closely match observed ratios. Supernova products are generally poorer fits and are essentially eliminated by a profound discrepancy in the helium-3 to helium-4 ratio. Q-phase data from Buzman et al. were included here when we noticed that the type 2 supernova ratios fit them rather well, especially uh, identical for three of the five neon and helium ratios and with offsets by factors of only two to three 
in the two others. Extraction and integration of helium and neon abundances generated by Rocher et al.'s nucleosynthetic calculations in an eight-shell type two supernova should be revisited. It's a massive database and I may have made mistakes. But if the supernova data in the figure turn out to be approximately correct, there's an interesting implication. Q phase carriers could be pre-solar supernova products. This last illustration has been purged of everything in the previous slide except for measured ratios in the anomalous IDPs and Starfield's calculations of products synthesized in a thermonuclear runaway on a neon nova. It represents our case for a nova origin of the gas carriers in the anomalous group. From an experimental point of view, perhaps the most diagnostic feature of the comparison is in the three to four helium ratio. Helium three is predicted to be essentially annihilated in the outburst, and there is no helium three within our detection limits in any of the anomalous IDPs. It remains to thank all the undergraduate and graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, and permanent laboratory colleagues, Richard Becker, Dennis Schluter, and Russell Palma for their immense contributions to Minnesota research programs over the years. Collaborations with other teams at other universities added valuable dimensions to the research. Departmental efforts on my behalf by Cynthia Cattell, Paul Kroll, and Brian Anderson are much appreciated. Finally, I deeply appreciate selection for the 2020 Whipple Award and lecture. My thanks to the Divisional Awards Committee for this great honor. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to make sure that everyone can hear me. Bob, can you hear me? Are you able to hear me there, Bob? We, um, well, I wanted to thank you again for your, uh, your presentation, and I'd like to open up the um, the audience, uh, open up the, the session for questions from the audience. If you do have a question, please feel free to enter it uh, under where it says questions and answers, and I will pass them along uh, to Bob. We do have a question already. Hopefully, um, we'll be able to uh, get our, our link together. But the question is, uh, given the presence of Mars meteors on Earth, uh, are you excited about Mars sample return and why? There, uh, on the other hand, uh, the advantages of is currently planned uh, is that the samples will come from a known place on Mars, which the Martian meteorites do not. We don't know where they came from on the planet. Uh, and they'll be very well uh, categorized uh, in terms of location and sampling techniques, none of which are available for the Martian meteorites we currently have. Uh, so yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> Great. Um, while we wait for uh, some more questions to roll in, uh, I had a question of my own. I, I was very intrigued by the whole um, puzzle, if you will, of, of xenon, uh, both on Earth and then Mars, um, and trying to, you know, understanding the way that the that puzzle was solved, if you will. And so it, it struck me, uh, what do we know about uh, xenon on a place, let's say like Venus, and or what would we, uh, what should we expect if we were to make measurements, uh, detailed measurements of xenon on, uh, on Venus? 
That's a very interesting question, uh, Michael. It's something that I have speculated about. Uh, <clears throat> the problem is that the observational data of xenon composition on Mars is in pretty wretched shape. Uh, there are a few clues here and there as to what it might be, but nothing definite enough, uh, enough to uh, hang a model on. My prediction, <laughs> for what it's worth, and I probably won't also be here to see whether it's right or wrong, uh, is, uh, uh, is that the atmosphere, the xenon in Venus's atmosphere will probably look a lot like you, xenon. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, reason for that is that it's not at all clear that there was ever such a massive outflowing uh, of escaping primordial atmosphere from xenon uh, from Venus as there was on Earth. Uh, and therefore, I would expect the atmosphere to be somewhat unfractionated compared with its in uh, initial inventory. And so for what it's worth, I think it'll be eusenon like But uh, <laughs> it'll take a while to find out. We need a competent mass spectrometer in the atmosphere of Venus. And uh, so far, we don't have one. Understood. Another question has come in from the audience. I'll read it. Supernova matter in uh, supernova matter input in the early solar nebula makes sense if the sun came from a cluster, but how does the white dwarf nova fit into the story when those may not have been around before the sun left its cluster? Oh, good question, Michael. Uh, <clears throat> I really don't know. Uh, the uh, the super matter, the supernova uh, matter input, uh, if the sun came from a cluster, but how does the white dwarf nova fit into the story when those may not have been around before the sun left its cluster? I don't know, you're venturing into areas that I'm not very familiar with. Uh, so uh, uh, I really sort of will punt on that question. Uh, all I can stand by is what the evidence for a nova origin of these particular particles is, and, uh, and for the moment, frankly, duck the question of how they happen to be there. Okay. Um, a number of people are chiming into the chat just thanking you for the presentation and for the talk. Uh, I like uh, wise would like to echo uh, their their kind words. I thought it was a very intriguing and interesting talk. Uh, I will I unless some more questions come in, I will leave you with one final uh, question. Maybe a, a, a you know thinking ahead to the future. What what do you still consider to be sort of the the biggest questions in in the field of noble gas or isotopic compositional uh, studies and what what do we need to do in order to answer those questions? I was hoping, <clears throat> I was hoping somebody would ask that type of question. Um, from the lecture itself, I'd isolate four areas where we're baffled. Uh, the first one has to do with Earth xenon. And if, in fact, the primordial xenon on Earth was you, xenon, where did it come from? What's its source? Uh, the fact that the u xenon composition agrees with meteoritic correlation suggests that, that u xenon is present in meteorites. But the search for it, while not in vain, has been a series of tantalizing hints that it's, fair, uh, that, it, that it's there and nothing truly definitive. So the question is, what's the origin of using it and where did it come from? The second one is the matter of the spallation component in the atmosphere of Mars. And I cannot understand if it's there, why its, its isotopic signature was not recorded in the meteoritic shock glasses. The, uh, the others, uh, I think, going back to the question that Michael Wong uh, asked, 
uh, what does the apparent presence of Nova thermonuclear runaway products in this set of anomalous IDPs really mean? Now, here we were lacking the kind of, of consortium approach that we had with Don Brownlee on the giant cluster particle. Uh, we had originally set up such a collaboration, but it never really was very active. So we don't know what's in these grains. Uh, my suspicion is that if they were subject to careful examination, we would find that there are extrasolar particles as a small contention in the grains, because the grains themselves are pretty big, and they can't be extrasolar particles themselves. So uh, those two things, uh, the, uh, the other questions raised in the lecture, I think are less obvious, but they're still bafflement. Uh, in terms of what the possible explanation for some of our observations uh, actually are. And I would encourage the audience, uh, if they have any thoughts on these and other issues that are presented as puzzles in the lecture, to uh, get in touch with me. And uh, uh, I'd be happy to enter into any sort of conversation that they might like to have. Thank you. Um, we have one final question that came in from Dave Demaray. Um, the so-called ice line in the early solar nebula seems to be less stable than previously thought. What perspectives do the noble gases provide about this? Well, except for the fact that meteorites that uh, uh, have essentially a, a, a uh, resided for a long time beyond the ice line, that is farther out, um, are very rich in volatiles, including water, like the carbonaceous chondrites. But those residing further in, on the inside of the ice, ice line, ice line uh, are in fact much poorer in volatiles. And so one could almost classify meteorites according to their locations on either side of the ice line from their volatile content uh, as to uh, where they presumably resided most of the time. And the type of examples, of course, are on the outside, the carbonaceous chondrites, and on the inside, the acetite chondrites. All right. Well, I wish to thank you again on behalf of the, the Planetary Sciences section for uh, a, a lifetime of uh, amazing contributions to our field uh, and for your very uh, insightful and thoughtful presentation today. Uh, I would also like to thank the audience for bearing with us while we, uh, while we overcame our, our slight technical issues. Uh, it, it wasn't the first time that's happened at this meeting and I'm sure it won't be the last, but everyone is, is absolutely working their hardest to make sure uh, we can make this meeting as, um, as in enjoyable and as uh, trouble-free as possible. So we do thank you for your, your patience in that matter. With that, I will bring this session to a close uh, and wish you the best uh, for the remainder of your AGU experience and um, go out and have fun. Thanks very much. <laughs>